I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Monroe County Board of Commissioners. It's May 19, 2021. Um, and as noted, we are all three present uh, and accounted for today. And we'll start with the public statement read by Commissioner Jones. We, the Monroe County Board of Commissioners, renew our commitment to welcome and protect the rights of all people, regardless of age, race, color, creed, disability, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, marital status, and econo economic status and national origin. And we affirm the right of every person to live peacefully and without fear. And we will fight and resist at every step discrimination and harmful policies, whatever their source. We also stand in support of our county public school systems, both RBB and MCCSC. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And next on our agenda, uh, department updates. And we'll begin with um, Ms. Caudill in the health department. Good, Good morning. morning. What, what a big week, right? In the, in the last week, lot, lots of changes. So I do want to start with vaccine and why that is so very important. Uh, all three of our vaccines that are available have, have been shown to be 99% effective at preventing severe illness and death. So these are vaccines now that we're being studied. It does not mean that you won't ever get infection. Um, they are extremely effective against infection, but even if you do become infected, the chances that you will have severe illness or death is extremely low. And I, I do mean extremely uh, low. Unvaccinated Hoosiers make up over 99% of the cases in Indiana. Uh, and that's even just since January, I, I believe. So that is not factoring in um, prior to vaccinations being available. So you can tell that vaccine does work. If you are fully vaccinated, uh, you can safely do more and you can avoid time off from work, from school, uh, due to quarantine. So there are many reasons that vaccination makes sense. Uh, as of yesterday, over 45% of our eligible population, 12 and over, had been fully vaccinated. And over 50% of that same group have received at least one dose of vaccine. The interest among our 12 to 15 year olds has been very high. And we are excited uh, to see families coming in uh, and getting vaccinated as a family. So not just bringing their child in um, to be vaccinated, but ensuring that the whole family is vaccinated. And that is a very, very good thing to see. I will remind people if transportation is a problem, there are rides available. If you schedule an appointment at a vaccination site, such as Assembly Hall, you can call 211 and they will verify your appointment. And then they can get you a voucher for an Uber uh, to and from that vaccination appointment. So we don't want uh, transportation to be a barrier. We are working with our schools. We have a small clinic at RBB this Friday to assist in people who may not be able to get to Assembly Hall. Uh, so we're happy to do that. And we have other vaccination clinics that are being planned around our community. Uh, if you are wondering what vaccine is available, where use that vaccine map, it will tell you. Uh, if it says JVAX, it's Johnson & Johnson. If it's PVAX, it's Pfizer. If it's MVAX, it's Moderna. So you can look and see where those vaccinations, uh, where that vaccine is if you are somebody who wants a particular vaccine. Our 12 to 17-year-olds, it's Pfizer is what they are eligible for. So that is just something to keep in mind. I'll, our local numbers do continue to improve. I expect us to be blue today. Uh, we're not completely out of the woods, however. And so lifting of our orders on Monday um, 
followed CDC guidance and local improvement. Uh, but it, I want to talk just a little bit about what that lifting of that regulation means and what it doesn't mean. So lifting of that regulation does not mean that we are back to pre-pandemic times. It does not mean that there is no need to ever wear a mask again, right? That's not at all what it means, but it does put more responsibility back on us as individuals um, to do what's right for us and our community. Uh, it does mean that we have changes that we also have to adapt to as we are learning more and more and more information is coming in. Uh, we're going to see changes continue and guidance continue to change. So let's take the responsibility to stay up to date to do the right thing. If I am unvaccinated, for anybody out there who's unvaccinated for whatever reason, maybe you're not for vaccine, haven't scheduled that appointment yet. Maybe you have an upcoming appointment, but, but you just haven't gotten it done yet. You still need to wear a mask and distance in almost all places uh, when you are in public situations. Uh, there are a couple exceptions to that, but if you're unvaccinated, you still need to be wearing your mask and socially distancing from others. Um, all of us need to observe requirements that are still in place. And there are some that are still in place. So federal buildings still require masks. State buildings, vaccine sites, testing sites still require masks. Public transportation, schools still require masks. Medical offices, most shelters, and many businesses. So as these guidances are changing, businesses are looking at their policies. Uh, they're making determinations about what works for them and their patrons. And we need to be respectful and mindful of those regulations um, and pay attention. So carry that mask with you, because even if you're fully vaccinated, you may go into a building or a business where you need to wear your mask. If you are vaccinated, if you're fully vaccinated, it's been two weeks since your second dose of Moderna or Pfizer, or two weeks after your Johnson & Johnson vaccine, then you, for the most part, don't have to wear your mask or distance except where it's required. So if you go into a business, you may still need to wear it. Uh, but keep in mind that some people are going to continue to wear that mask, even though they may be fully vaccinated, and for very good reasons. Some people uh, will do that to model behavior for their children. They may have children under the age of 12 who cannot be vaccinated behavior because those children still need to be wearing their mask. They may be have a compromised immune system. They may have a family member who has a compromised immune system and they are wearing that mask for added protection. And they may just be concerned and not ready to let go of that mask. I can tell you, I am fully vaccinated. I have it, the utmost confidence in my vaccination status, but when I am in public in crowded venues, I'm probably still gonna be wearing my mask unless I know who, I, who I'm around and can evaluate that situation. So if it's close proximity, I anticipate at least for a little while longer, I'll be wearing my mask in many situations. Businesses, again, they certainly are within their right to decide who and when they require masks. Um, and so the other things that businesses will be doing, hopefully, is continue to use good ventilation and cleaning procedures just because the regulations go away does not mean that the recommendations go away. So using good ventilation, using cleaning, uh, even easing back into what might feel like more of a normal routine can make sense for people. Um, and I would also think about what other requirements or recommendations your patrons may be encountering in other places. So I've heard some people say, well, this business is no longer wearing masks, but yet they're, re they're required for, for school-aged children. Well, so we have to think about, does that make sense for my business? What do I wanna do? What do my patrons, 
You know, if I'm catering to parents of school age children, how do I feel about that regulation um, and that requirement within my business? So those are all things businesses are going to be thinking about. The data and circumstances, we will continue to monitor that. Uh, we'll make future decisions based on those things. Uh, it's really in our hands in terms of how we follow the recommendations and how we ease back into more normal life. If we need to respond as a health department, um, the health officer, if we find that we need to deal with a particular situation, maybe someplace is not requiring masks, they're not making them, but we're seeing an outbreak, then we'll intervene in that situation. If we need to, if we see data that says we need to roll something back, we don't want to go backwards, but we certainly can if we have to do that. Another question that I have been asked is about compliance officers, and they will be um, on task to help us for a little while longer, uh, not enforcing regulations because we have lifted those, but really helping answering questions for businesses and really just being our eyes and ears, letting us know what businesses are experiencing with this change. So that's kind of where that is. I know I've had questions about that. Finally, I want to mention schools again. Schools have been a hybrid this past year and a half. Um, they're, they're not that basic business. They're not retail food. You know, they, they are truly a hybrid. And they have guidance that is in place, and they have been advised to keep that guidance until they complete the school year. Summer school guidance just came out, I think last week it was, uh, certainly in the last 10 days. Um, and so they have summer school guidance now to follow. So these children are still going to be required to wear masks in most situations um, because many of them cannot be vaccinated. The, the fall guidance is not yet out. And things are gonna change over the summer. Don't expect school guidance to come really quickly. It very well could be July, uh, maybe later before that guidance is out. So as data and information comes, the guidance will be adapted. So just wanted to talk about that. The health department supports our schools. We work with them to maintain practices, masks, size limits until this term is over. I know that can be difficult because when we, you lifted the, the regulations, uh, but schools, again, were a hybrid anyway. And so we do want them to maintain their uh, policies until they get completely through the school year. So we support those actions and those steps, and we will work with them to figure out any special circumstances that they may have. And I think that I have covered most everything that I wanted to talk about. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Cottle. Always a lot of great information. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? I'm just excited that we're kind of seeing the end of the tunnel. Um, but, of course, we do still have to be pretty careful. It would be terrible to go backward. That is what we really want to avoid. Yeah. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Gibbons? No, I just thank Ms. Cottle for all her incredible work and the work of her entire staff. They've been amazing through all of this. Yeah. Absolutely. Pass on our thanks. And we know that um, the work isn't over as you will be closely monitoring the situation. And if need be, we'll have to deal with um, some short term. Hopefully we won't. Um, but any short term issues that come up that you're going to have to deal with. So many thanks. Thank you. We do have our last official second dose clinic at the convention center going on right today. Thanks to all those volunteers out there too. My goodness, yeah, excellent. And big thanks to the convention center. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you so much. And next we have emergency management, Ms. Allison Moore. Good morning. Good morning. What a great transition to thank that convention center. We have two blood drives scheduled in May and we have had all of our blood drives that we started last March up until now. 
Um, that convention center has been the host of those drives and they have continued to have those scheduled out through the summer. So we are so blessed that they um, have been able to open those doors for us and allow these blood drives. The two we have scheduled in May are the daytime, the 24th of May, it's from 10 to three. And our evening drive is from two to seven on the 27th. We do still have some spots available. So you can hop over to the redcross.org website and make an appointment uh, during a time slot, because even though we do see that light, we are still doing those things that help um, with the COVID prevention. And so we still have appointments for those drives um, and we will continue to do that um, through the summer. The appointment slots seem to work best due to COVID. So we will continue to have that set up um, and continue to thank that convention center and the Red Cross, of course, for collaborating with our office in Monroe County to have these amazing drives. Um, it is still May, um, and so we have a couple more weeks of electrical safety month, um, and this week I would like to just remind people to make sure that your cords are not in water. Oftentimes, you know, those kitchen appliances and such, sometimes things are spilled and you don't quickly pick those up and then they can absorb some of that moisture. So make sure that you are um, having proper cleaning um, throughout the kitchen for those appliances and make sure that they're not in water and of course outside as well. If you have um, electrical outlets outside your home and it's um, a wet environment, make sure that they are not in any standing water. And then to give your appliances um, proper space for circulation. So make sure that there are a little bit of space outside of your cabinetry um, or the walls, um, of course, in barns and garages as well. If you have things that are plugged in, uh, make sure you're not having them plugged in when you're not using them. And of course, make sure when you are that you're giving that proper circulation so that they do not overheat. So two helpful hints to just think of things that we probably do, but sometimes it gets forgotten and then they can cause, um, you know, huge, huge fires. And so just a, cute, a couple different helpful prevention. Um, I had mentioned last month that Sherwood Oaks was our Sherwood Oaks tornado siren was temporarily down. Um, it actually we got it back up and running before our May um, siren test and I had forgotten to announce to you that we had been able to get that equipment in so it was only down for a couple weeks and uh, fortunately we were able to get the supplies in and when we tested it the first Friday of May it was successful with all of the new um, antennas and coax supplies that had been put in so I'm happy to report that sorry that um, I was a little a little tardy in reporting that but it has been successful um, we did notice at our May test that we have two sirens that sounded but did not rotate. So we have purchased um, belts for those and they have just come in. So this week we'll be um, placing those belts on those so that they rotate properly. And then we'll be able to check that at our June tornado siren, making sure that they do rotate. And then if not, we have other steps that will, um, for the maintenance of those that we will then activate and, and then test those the next month. So fortunately all of our 41 sirens are activating properly, but we do have two that are not currently rotating. Um, just for those neighborhoods that may, for them that may sound slightly different um, because they're currently do not rotate, it is the American Legion in Ellettsville and the Ivy Tech um, tornado siren. So both of those will activate, but they currently will not rotate until we get a little bit of proper maintenance on those. So just happy to report that, to report that and that is all I have for you. That's why you have tests. Thank you so much, Ms. Moore. Sure. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, I'm just delighted that you do do the monthly tests. It, um, without them, there's no telling what the situation might actually be when, when the sirens are needed. So yeah, thank you very much for sure. your maintenance of them. Comments, questions, Commissioner Giffins? I've scheduled my next blood donation for next week. So um, I encourage anybody who's able to do that. It's a unique gift that we can give to others. That's great. Excellent. Um, yep. And um, just be aware that this is tornado season. It's been very, very quiet, um, which has been great, but it, we don't know if it's going to stay that way or not. 
So sure. I, sh I guess I should add the weather is shifting. It's going to be super hot. Um, people are not used to that warm weather. So make sure that you're prepared for that. Um, you know, mosquitoes are going to come because of this hot moisture. And then like Commissioner uh, Thomas said, anything can happen when that weather shifts and we are definitely in that tornado season. So lots of changes here within our weather between, uh, between the seasons here happening. And, and yes, so our office will definitely be on high alert for those situations and we hope that it continues to stay calm. Yeah, excellent. And uh, for anybody who wants to get updates on everything from health orders and vaccine clinics to uh, storm warnings, um, please go to co.monroe.in.us, click on the megaphone and sign up for the resident alert system. Excellent. Thank you so much. And next we have uh, Ms. Ridge with a report on a highway. Good morning. Good morning. So just wanted to tell you where some crews are working at. So hopefully um, people will avoid these areas. We don't close the road. It's under um, lane restrictions and we do have flaggers and such, but still if you can avoid these areas and less traffic, it makes it safer for the workers in the, in the roadway. Um, we have various locations that they'll be doing, uh, patching potholes, grading gravel roads and trimming brush around the county. Anderson Road from Shiloh to Low Gap, uh, they should be paving that yesterday and today uh, in the hours between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. Um, Breezewood Court, we are doing a full depth patch in that area from Monday through Thursday of this week. Birch Road, our stormwater crews will be doing ditching in the area Wednesday and Thursday of this week between the hours of 6 to 4. And on Old 37 North from Anderson Road to Chambers Pike, uh, we will be paving that May 20th um, through May 21st, and we ask anybody to avoid that area also. And if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Great, thank you so much. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Just glad to see the patching happening. Commissioner Giffins? Yeah, are we in the, the season where the highway crews are working 10 hour days? Or when you does that correct. start? Yep, we started that, we set a schedule this year um, between, um, I think it was May 3rd, the first week of May, and it will end the last week of August. And that will be uh, the summer hours are six to four, Monday through Thursday. This allows longer hours during the day when we are paving because it's, it is a, such a setup. Um, and then that way we can try and finish the job and not close it, not have to you know, work overtime to try and finish it up in a day's time. So it helps us during those four months out of the year to be able to work longer and, and get the paving done since it takes quite a crew to accomplish that. So smart. Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Ms. Ridge. We appreciate you and we will see you in a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and with that, we um, come to the portion of our agenda for public comment. And this would be for items that are not on our agenda. And um, uh, you have a maximum time of three minutes. This also holds true for our agenda items later. Uh, when you get to two minutes and 30 seconds, you will hear a tone. And when you hear that, you have such great timing. You have 30 seconds left to finish uh, your thoughts. Um, and then you will be cut off unmercifully at three minutes. But that's the way it has to be, to be fair to everyone. OK, with that, it looks like we have two hands raised. The first one, uh, Greg Alexander. Awesome. Uh, thanks. My name is Greg Alexander. Um, I'm, uh, you know, like everybody looking at this uh, annexation process that the city is initiating. And to me, it, it doesn't matter who administers this land. I, I think it just needs to be administered well. You know, people need to get the services they need. So, you know, I hope if the city does annex a lot of land that they recognize that they have to fund the county justice operations, for example. Um, one thing that, that I think the county has done a really good job on the last couple of years that the city hasn't um, is the, the Monroe County Urbanizing Area Plan. You know, you've thought about this question about what to do about these, the mile fringe basically around the city. And, you know, you've done a lot of work on that too, like the Profile Parkway extension and the, the 
with the Sunrise greeting card extension. Um, and so I, I think that's that's really promising. And you know, it's frustrating when I see, for example, the city recently had a, a zoning request come before city council, and it to me it was it was the Clear Creek question was was what they were deciding there. But they're the city; they, they haven't really thought about the Clear Creek question before. And so I think you know the fact that the county has an urbanizing area plan and thought about this is something we really need to, to preserve and leverage and, and get advantage out of. And, and I hope that that happens regardless of how annexation goes. But my concern is last week, um, you all turned down at a project, I think it was called the Clear Creek Urban. And that, that project was pretty much cut and pasted straight out of the urbanizing area plan. Um, the, the lady that brought that forward to you had, had clearly tried to honor the intent of the plan that, that you guys had already passed a couple of years ago. And it, I don't know exactly why the decisions were made. I can't tell you what the right decision should have been, but it looked like you guys ignored the urbanizing area plan. And if you guys aren't going to be good stewards and use the plans that you have, then maybe the city should annex all that land. So I really don't know, but I think that's just something you ought to keep in mind that, that you have to demonstrate to the world that you're doing a good job of, of managing this land. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Jim Shelton. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Jim Shelton with the Chamber of speaking one last time about our CASA training uh, coming up in June. We'll have a training June 7th through the 30th. Applications are due just about now. So uh, probably anybody who hasn't heard of this before is not gonna think about it that fast, but there are folks out there I know who have been thinking about it and uh, just wanna make sure they realize there is gonna be a training uh, June 7th. The next one won't be till October. So if this is something that you've been thinking about, now would be a good time to do it. You can go to MonroeCountyCasa.org, click on the volunteer link, and you can find the application. You can fill it out online and have it submitted today, and it'll still be time to uh, possibly get into this class. For those who haven't thought about it, it's a wonderful volunteer opportunity to help children. They're in the court system, not because of anything they did. Most, well, half of them are under five. They're in there because their parents have abused and neglected them. So they're probably in a foster home or with a, a relative and the parents are trying to do what the courts told them they have to do to be reunited. And the CASA is a, a second set of eyes and ears for the court. Uh, Judge Galvin very, and Judge Harvey value the input from the CASA. So you have the opportunity to really help children, to really help strengthen our community because how we deal with children is the, our future. So please think about it. Uh, you can go to MonroeCountyCasa.org and also get a lot of information or you can call and talk to a staff member at 333-2272. So please think about it and thank you all so much for the opportunity to use your megaphone. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Shelton. Uh, looks like we have another hand raised. Margaret Clements, please. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I'm just going to respond to Mr. Alexander's um, comments um, just because um, there were some allegations there about us not being good administrators of the county and of the land. And um, I would like to say that as the city increasingly uh, fails to follow its comprehensive plan, which we saw in uh, evidence over the last few months with their changes in the UDO, um, it puts increasing pressures on us in the county. And um, I think it's a game changer as far as the area urbanizing plan is concerned. I think that we need to reconsider exactly what shape and what vision we have for the county going forward. And I would like all of us to urge uh, each other and uh, work together as the with the commissioners, the planning department, et cetera, to re-envision the rural character of our area and see what we can do to protect it and protect our fragile environment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clements. Appreciate that. And I don't see any other hands raised. If you do wanna speak, uh, click on the raise hand button at the bottom of the screen. Okay, I don't see any. So with that, we will move on to our uh, next uh, agenda item, which has a typo in it. <laughs> I don't see 
a typo. <laughs> uh, move approval of the minutes for March 12th, 2021. <laughs> and that's the typo. It should be May 12th. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're just setting traps for you. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I will believe it. <laughs> I will second approval of the minutes from May 12th, 2021. <laughs> awesome. Um, any comments, questions, or edits on that item? I had seen one um, edit that is already, a correction that's already been made then uh, with what's on the website. Excellent, thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on approval of minutes from May 12, 2021? Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Githens. Yes. <laughs> minutes are approved, 3-0. Excellent, next item please. Move approval of the claims docket, accounts payable, May 19th, 2021, and payroll, May 21st, 2021. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second, and we have Mr. Miller from the auditor's office. Good morning, commissioners. I hope you're all doing very well today. Uh, the total for claims was $1,540,855.65. Uh, $324,271.52 was for Anthem, Blue Cross, and Blue Shield for May claims and fees. $206,210.41 was for the City of Bloomington for May uh, PSAP Lit or Public Safety Answering Point Local Income Tax uh, for Central Dispatch. $165,439.21 was uh, for City of Bloomington for 2020 contract payment for the animal shelter interlocal agreement. And finally, $119,020 was for Purdue University Cooperative for 2021 contractual services. Uh, as far as payroll, the total was $1,626,095.50. Uh, $1,147,600.88 were for the direct costs and the remaining $478,494.62 were for the indirect costs. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Miller. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? No, I don't. Commissioner Giffins? No, I always appreciate the precision that things are presented with, Mr. Miller, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Just raise your hand at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And that will let us know that you'd like to make a comment. I do not see any. And so, Mr. Hoppo, will you please call the roll on the uh, approval of uh, claims docket accounts payable May 19th, 2021, and payroll May 21st, 2021? Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Thank you. Right, thank you so much. Um, and I will note for the record that um, we have received two reports. The first is from the clerk of the circuit court and that's for April of 2021 and a report from the treasurer and that is for April of 2021. Uh, and with that, we will move on to new business, please. Move to approve a practicum partnership with the IU School of Social Work. Second. We have a motion and a second, and we have Ms. Renbeck joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think the explanation and the agenda item is, covers pretty much most of what I'm going to be asking or speaking with you about, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, I've already been in touch with uh, Commissioner Givens and answering some questions for her, but I'm happy to explain further any anything that might be needed. Okay. Can you give a brief summary of it for uh, anybody who might be watching and not have the package? Yes, open? absolutely. Um, so I'm a deputy public defender in our public defender's office, and we are working with the IU School of Social Work. We're working, we're interested in working with them to host a social work intern. Um, we would start this fall with a bachelor student, a bachelor of social work student, and then in the spring with a master student. Um, our goals are to um, 
assist our clients further with the assistance of these social work interns and also determine if there is um, enough need in our community, in our office particularly, to potentially request a social worker position, you know, more, more permanently going forward in our office. Um, so for now, at least we are asking for the commissioners to uh, approve um, Mr. Hunt, my, my boss, the chief public defender, Michael Hunt, to, um, to sign the contract and partner with the IU School of Social Work to, to host these interns. They are doing this as part of their degree, so they're working a certain number of hours and um, they'll have supervisors both in our office and at the social work school um, to monitor you know, what they're up to and what they're doing, make sure they're getting all their hours in. And um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, this is um, a good movement towards more rehabilitative justice. And I'm, I'm actually very pleased to see it happening. And it's a good way to try it out without investing a whole lot of money up front and not being sure exactly how it'll work out. So thank you for looking into this. Yeah, absolutely. We are, we're most excited about the interns, I think, because part of the social work interns, what they are very good at is, you know, collecting data and keeping track of what they're, you know, accomplishing. So we're hopeful this will help us get some better statistics on like what the needs of our clients are and be able to report that to like the county council in the future. Um, and I mean, we also do uh, some social work in our office now, but, you know, we are not social workers, but we end up kind of wrapping that in. So we, we would love to have someone who's properly trained kind of explain to us, maybe we should be doing things better. So yes, thank you. Commissioner Giffins? Well, it, uh, as Ms. Renbeck said, we, we emailed a little bit, but I think that the, uh, this win-win kind of setup should free up the people in the public defender's office, the lawyers, to actually be doing legal work and not doing social work. And so I'm, I'm pleased to see this. Um, I, I think it has a lot of advantages in terms of uh, reducing things that we'd like to see reduced within the criminal justice system. Um, so I'm very pleased that, you're that you've taken this initiative. Yeah, and I have to shout out our paralegals in our office too. They, are, they do so much social work. It is, they do so much for treatment and helping our clients get into treatment. And they are really excited at the prospect of having a, a social work intern to try to help them too. So. Excellent. Thank you so much. Let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Just yeah. click on the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, Ms. Clements, good morning. Hi. Um, I, I'm. This is not uh, the first time that I'm going to say this, but I would like to encourage the commissioners to consider that even though um, having interns can be a, a bonus, um, that there is a cost to the county for supervising interns and that uh, we're going to be training interns um, for really fees that the university receives uh, for the courses. And I would like to encourage the commissioners to seek some kind of payment or reimbursement for time exerted by the county in supervising uh, these interns because it's a rather pervasive practice. And um, I've found in my own work that uh, the work product of interns isn't always sustainable and that uh, the cost is, uh, the hidden costs are a lot higher than uh, one would initially assume. And so I would just like to enter that into the discussion for consideration now and into the future because the local burden is quite high as far as uh, intern supervision. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Ms. Clemens. You raise an interesting point. Um, let's see if there's anyone else who wishes to offer um, comments or questions. Okay. All right, seeing none, uh, we'll come back to um, the board. Uh, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on the uh, motion to approve a practicum partnership with the IU School of Social Work? Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Giffins? Yes. Motion is approved, three to zero. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you. 
Next item, please. Move to approve Indiana Department of Health Immunization Grant Agreement. Fund name, immunization. Fund number 8138-9622 in the amount of $299,296.80. Second. We have a motion and a second, and we have Ms. Cottle joining us again. Good morning. Good morning again. So this is, every year we receive immunization funding. This is an additional grant for immunizations, and it really came from COVID and a, the part of that response. And this particular funding does require and is about continuing COVID-19 immunizations, uh, promotion, education, um, go, taking it out into the community and that kind of thing. We do anticipate that this will be extended in, into 2024. Um, so it's not uncommon for us to get amendments to immunization grants or any grants for that matter uh, once we kind of get into uh, the the depth of, of the term. So I do in, anticipate that this will grow in, and become larger and last until 2024. As you know, we contract with IU Health for public health nursing, which includes our immunization program. And our preliminary thoughts for this money is really to secure specific nursing staff and perhaps some, a couple community health workers who can actually be the people who are going out and uh, taking vaccine to the community. Uh, they will help in terms of other vaccinations as well. There are some other pieces to this in that we will have to go in and do a check. We don't actually have authority over uh, other providers who are giving vaccine, but that we would go in and essentially do an audit for the state for those providers um, so that's part of it. And this, these individuals would then um, have that as part of their duty as well. So that's kind of what we're envisioning for this, uh, at least in the uh, immediate uh, term. Um, and so we would just funnel, you know, move this through like we do our other immunization money with IU Health as part of that. Um, it, it could be used in some other uh, ways as well. Uh, but that's kind of what we are envisioning. I will, I need to note, however, that as, as I'm just sitting here and looking at, looking over this before I spoke, um, we have received several grants recently that are from the same division, uh, the same CFDA number, but they've actually come with different award numbers. So I believe we will need to change the fund number on this. I actually believe that we already have done that, but I do not have it in front of me at this moment. So just to note that this will not be an 8138, which is our standard immunization fund. Okay, great. And I can bring back next week what the actual fund number is just as information. Yeah, and I actually don't know that we need to do that. Mr. Kotko, do we actually have to have that? I don't, I don't think you have to have it. I think having that in the minutes and it, as part of the recording that that's going to be added is sufficient. Okay. So I will note that the fund number will be um, revised and, um, and um, we will not be necessarily bringing this back um, um, to the next board meeting. So thank you for that. Um, appreciate the uh, diligence. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, um, are the other entities that you'll be auditing, are those doctor's offices and places like that, schools? Yeah. Yes, so anyone who is, and I can find it in here, <laughs> if I can look fast enough, um, can, let's see, conduct compliance site visits, uh, on vaccinator providers uh, within the jurisdiction. So the only place that I think we may not be going is uh, it may not include the pharmacies because they're part of the federal pharmacy program. Uh, but if they are part of the state program and receiving vaccine through the state, 
then I believe those would be the entities that we would be going to. And again, it is just kind of us going in and doing the audit, checking, you know, what are they doing and then submitting that to the state and then the state will assess how well they did or did not do. But it does, yeah, it ensures uh, cold chain custody, those kinds of things that it's being stored adequately, uh, all of those kinds of things are in place. All right, thank you so much. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Giffens? Uh, again, I just wanna thank uh, Ms. Cottle for going out and getting this type of grant. It, it protects people throughout our community. Yeah. It's a big deal, and uh, we certainly appreciate all the hard work that goes into um, making this work happen, but also in getting the grant, securing the grant. So thank you for that. Uh, let's see if there's any public comment on this particular item. And I do not see any. So with that, uh, Mr. Cocker, will you please call the roll on the motion to approve the Indiana State Department of Health Immunization Grant Agreement with the fund number to be determined. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Great, thank you. And we'll move on to the next item. Move to approve Indiana State Department of Health DIS slash STD grant agreement. Fund name DIS slash STD, fund number 8180 in the amount of $17,925. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Ms. Caudill, will you tell us about this one? Certainly. So when I brought to you this, the DIS STD grant that you signed a week or so ago, we talked about the loss to care funds and kind of a partnership with Positive Link in working with our disease intervention specialists so that we weren't duplicating services but the idea of what loss to care is, is making sure that people who have been positive remain in care, that they don't kind of some, maybe lose health insurance and then not have the care that they need. So it is ensuring that they have sort of that case management. And that's where our part, this will be a partnership with Positive Link to ensure that we can communicate and ensure that without duplicating of services, having two people contact an in individual versus one, for example. So uh, this is another example that it mm. came in two separate awards. So the actual fund number for this will be 8183, Lost to Care. Um, it did not come as an amendment to the other STD DIS grant. So uh, we will be changing this fund number as well. And that is exactly what caught my eye for the other one. Uh, I had made the note on this one and not on that one. <laughs> so we'll make a note that the uh, fund number is going to be revised um, and that uh, we can pass that without having um, the specific fund number uh, in place. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? No, I don't. Commissioner Giffins? Yeah, just thanks again. I, I cannot imagine how many balls you are constantly <laughs> juggling over there. Absolutely. Yes, and let's see if there's any um, public comments on this item. Just raise your hand at the bottom of the Zoom screen to alert us and there's a three minute maximum per commenter per item. All right, I do not see any. So with that, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on the Indiana State Department of Health DIS STD grant agreement, noting that the fund number will be revised. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Next item, please. Move to approve Ordinance 2021-23, Electronic Attendance Policy for Monroe County Public Meetings. Second. We have a motion and we have a second and we have Ms. Rice. Good morning. So here we are in Zoom, um, which is a treat that we've been allowed during COVID, if you will, if you're trying to look for a silver lining. Um, the treat has been that we've been able to, to meet electronically 
during the pandemic and we've enjoyed a lot of public access and involvement in our meetings since um, we've been able to use this technology to continue these public meetings. As you may remember, the norm in Indiana before COVID was that all public meetings had to be in person, held publicly in a place where the public could come and view the meeting and record it. So we are allowed to continue to meet publicly um, as long as the governor's, I mean, to meet electronically, as long as the governor's executive order is in place. That's set to cease uh, the end of this month, the end of May. And after that time, we will have to comply with a new law that has been adopted by the General Assembly. It will allow for partial um, participation electronically. The new law allows us to have um, up to half of our uh, members of a governing body in person, and then others can be meeting electronically. There are a lot of different nuances of the new law. And what you have before you today is an ordinance to adopt a policy that allows this governing body, the commissioners, to meet electronically. Um, I've incorporated the law as it is written and as an exhibit, um, section 3.5 of the new law and then the House Enrolled Act 1437 is exhibit B. So all of the language is there for your review and for the public's review. Um, I'd like you to adopt this this ordinance today so that you do have the flexibility that is allowed by law. Now, of course, we can't continue to have completely virtual meetings um, after the governor's executive order ceases. However, we can, we can enjoy the flexibility that 1437 does give. Um, and each governing body has to adopt a policy themselves. But because our boards and commissions have various meeting dates and some of them won't meet until June, I've asked in this ordinance that you sort of give a blanket authority um, legislatively to all of those governing bodies to go ahead and, and meet this way until such time as they can get together and adopt their own policy. I'm happy to answer any questions. I know Jeff Cockrell knows this law very well too. We've talked about it in our office. We've also uh, prepared resolutions for each governing body to be able to adopt their own policy. And I know some have already, have already entertained those. Uh, we've got a Board of Health meeting tonight and a Parks Board meeting tonight. They'll be looking at their own policies as well. Um, so this is just us reacting to the law as it's been changed. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? No, there's been a lot of discussion about this and uh, I, I would like to thank the state legislature for letting us continue to have these electronic meetings, which does allow for so much more public participation. Uh, Commissioner Giffins? Yeah, I, I do want to point out too that there are exceptions that there are times when all of us have to be there in, in person um, so that uh, if there's a new tax passed or other situations, there are times when we cannot dial in, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And um, and then I would like to point out sort of the, the other side of it, which is why um, it's a good idea to use this policy, especially until we get COVID totally under control, which I hope actually happens. Um, uh, we had this discussion last night at the Planning Commission meeting, um, and a couple of members were like, we should all be present, and, you know, that would be ideal, but, you know, I think it's better to not all be present, um, because that is, that could be a health risk um, for folks, and, um, and if any, um, anyone is immunocompromised um, and is a participant or a member of a board or a commission, that's a really, that's a big ask. Um, and so this gives us that leeway to make sure that people are protected. Uh, but we will continue, our plan is to utilize um, a hybrid meeting system and big kudos and thanks to Eric Evans for working on this, um, where you will be able to zoom in from home if that's more convenient, um, or you can appear in person um, as a member of the public. Uh, but this also gives that same flexibility to our members of boards and commissions, and it's a really important thing. So 
I appreciate you working on this. Um, the Planning Commission decided to wait until June 1st to consider this uh, for the Planning Commission administrative and regular meetings because they did not have a chance to read through um, their version of the resolution and also they were aware that we're gonna be considering this today, so. All right. Um, and and if I, I would like to point out that if there's a local emergency declaration or the governor does declare an emergency in the future, then we probably will be able to do 100% uh, electronic participation. So, you know, the good news is that the General Assembly has, has recognized that there's some benefit to this, provided a situation when it can happen electronically. Um, and so it's, it's inching us into the 21st century. And Indiana is not always the fastest at moving forward. And so um, we're gonna take what we can get and, and be grateful for this, this new law. And um, again, I, I do wanna um, get also shout out to TSD because I know they put a lot of work into giving us all that we've needed during this pandemic to meet electronically. And they're continuing to work on the upgrades to the Nat Hill room. And I know we've heard from so many members of the public who really appreciated that. So thanks to them. Yeah, yeah, great point. And uh, TSD not only gets the chime right on time, but they do everything else that makes these meetings work that's actually important. Um, so, all right, let's see if there's any um, public comment on this item. Um, just raise your hand at the um, um, bottom of the Zoom screen. It looks like we have a few. Um, and it includes, um, it looks like we have a question that's coming up for Mr. Askin. So Ms. Rice, you might want to stay on screen. We'll start with uh, the first hand raised, uh, Mr. Shelton. Good morning again. Uh, as a member of one of your commissions, in fact, we meet this afternoon at 4.30 and this same item is on our agenda. That's the Redevelopment Commission. Uh, I appreciate this. I appreciate what TSD's done. I appreciate them having a rep at our meetings that keep us safe because uh, you guys have been Zoom bombed. We've been Zoom bombed. It's uh, not wonderful. So please do approve this. I certainly, as a uh, senior citizen with diabetes, uh, I am uh, certainly glad that you've got the opportunity for us to make our own decisions about our circumstances when we have to. So I think you've done a really good job. I watched the discussion last night on the plan commission and I, again, will participate in one this afternoon. And I think really every body and commission is different. I think the discussion last night about uh, the advantages of having people present during some of the plan commission discussions would be dramatically different from uh, the election commission or even the redevelopment commission where we have very little public in person, but we do have public uh, through Zoom. So please do approve this and thank you, Ms. Rice and uh, Mr. Cockrell, et cetera, and to TSD for their efforts. All right, thank you, we appreciate that. Uh, next up, uh, Ms. Uh, Cassidy, good morning. Hi there, this is Tambi Michael Cassidy. Um, I just have a couple quick comments. First of all, I do appreciate the flexibility that uh, Zoom meetings have allowed. Um, I, feel, I feel, however, that face-to-face -face meetings can be more effective in many circumstances and um, do agree that the different meetings require uh, different things. And so I just want to say that I do appreciate um, continuing forward with having that flexibility. Um, I have a couple of concerns that I want to mention because I've been a part of so many meetings over this past year as a participant. And that probably feels different than what you experience because you're on the other side of what's being conducted. So um, one of those things is that, um, you know, the conductor of your meeting sometimes locks out participants to be not in the room. And so then uh, I myself can't see who the other participants are. Um, and so if I'm in a public meeting and, and there's a physical presence, I can see that, I can read the room, I can see if people are happy or sad and, and you know, and, and I can, uh, it helps to um, communicate. I mean, I think that, you know, being able to see people communicate is very important. 
Um, it's difficult for sometimes for people to figure out how to unmute their microphone. And by the way, it's totally different if you use a PC versus an iPad. The microphone isn't at the bottom, it's somewhere else. So just being aware that it's not always the same. Maybe, maybe you could do something for a while, like a few minutes before every meeting, have your TSD people come on and tutor people a little bit or something like that. You know, there's, there are different um, opportunities for helping with that, I'm, I'm sure. Um, I also think it's it, chatting in the background. Um, I've experienced it, I've done it myself, haven't chosen to done it at other times. And then it's my understanding it's not record, it's not part of the record. So maybe it should be discouraged unless you're just trying to get something to function that you can't. Um, I just, these are just suggestions that I have, <laughs> again, as being a participant. And um, I think I already mentioned this, the, the participant list cannot be seen unless it's opened up as a, I don't, I'm not sure what you call this mode, if it's a lecture mode or a panelist mode, but you know, I know, I, I saw a little thing today on my screen I'd never seen before where I could see there were 29 attendees and 14 panelists. So I can't see 14 panelists, um, uh, but um, again, I'm, I think I'm just in attendee mode. So I think it would be nice if you could go back to the open Zoom where you can see people um, who are speaking and um, participate in the meeting. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate that. Um, Mr. Askins. Good morning, commissioners. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I do want that uh, even though I can ask questions during public comment time, there's absolutely no legal obligation for the questions to get answered, but I appreciate during the whole time of the pandemic, um, the, the county commissioners have been uh, real helpful in that regard, so I appreciate that. Um, just want to clarify a couple of things. As I understand the new statute, uh, at least two of the county commissioners will have to attend in person, which means only one of the commissioners will be able to participate um, remotely electronically. So I'm looking to get confirmation of that as uh, question number one. Uh, question two, can we go ahead and put June 2nd on the calendar as the first in-person meeting uh, for the um, county commissioners? And if so, have you decided which of you three will get to permit uh, participate remotely? Are you going to draw straws? How is that going to work? Um, and finally, the uh, plan commission's meeting on June 1st, based on the ordinance that you're considering today, assuming that it passes and it sounds like it's going to pass, um, will they be able to uh, hold a hybrid meeting on June 1st or will they have to do that June 1st meeting in person and adopt their own ordinance? Um, or not their own ordinance, but their own um, uh, procedures. Um, so those are th the three questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm happy, I'm happy to answer the first and third questions. Uh, the first question um, is yes, two commissioners will have to be present. Um, as for how they're going to decide that, I don't know. The law does have specifics. We have to keep track of who's participating in person, who's participating electronically, what what they use to participate electronically. Of course, um, your vote isn't considered if we can't see and hear you. Um, so if there's something that happens that we can't see and hear you and your vote can't be recorded by roll call, your vote won't count. So um, it may very well be that, you know, that commissioners show up in person. Who, that's up to these, this body, this governing body. Every governing body can figure that out on their own. Um, your third question is our plan is that what the commissioners are doing today will apply to all governing bodies and that they'll be able to hold those meetings after June um, via um, an electronic format and that this is sort of a stopgap measure until they can adopt their own governing policy. I do read the law that every, every governing body has to adopt its own policy uh, we're hoping that by the executive and legislative body of the whole county allowing this for those governing bodies, that that will get us through until such time as they can do that. That may be a creative interpretation of the law, um, but it's what we've we've gone with as a way um, to sort of help them transition to this this new hybrid way. Um, certainly, if there's a board of commission that decides they want to have their meeting 
in June, their, that next meeting in person, the buildings are gonna be open and we'll try to accommodate that so that they can, they can get that done. And as for the second question, I really think that's a commissioner answer. <laughs> and, and I would just add to the, to the third question is that that is presuming that the governor does not extend the emergency declaration. Um, so I don't think we could put anything in stone until we know whether that will or will not occur. Right. That that changes the. Uh, we are making an assumption that the that this that the governor is going to let his order lapse on May thirty first as it's intended to expire at that date. Um, and that obviously is as Ms. Cottle mentioned earlier, does not take into account the fact that a local emergency or another emergency declared by the state may. Um, also come into play at which at which time we would we would have the opportunity to have an all electronic all zoom meeting um, uh, in order to protect people's lives and uh, when it comes to that that's we love transparency but living's even better so um, so uh, I don't know if my colleagues want to comment on question number two we haven't really talked about this yet I I can say that I have enough problems with my connections so that I'll only be tempted to participate electronically if there's some really good reason for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, and, and the good thing is, is that staff can uh, work remotely and that means they could be in their office, they could be home, wherever it's safest. Um, you know, we, we do want to encourage people to use Zoom. Yeah, clearly there are instances where we can't and where um, the public may want to be in person, but until this pandemic is really uh, under control, um, it's just better to, to join electronically if you have that option. If it's comfortable for you, if you have the connectivity, if that works for you, if it makes you comfortable, then that's great. Um, it just like wearing masks, we are gonna respect all viewpoints on how to proceed, uh, whether you're attending a meeting electronically or in person. So I think that's kind of a long way of answering that question. And no, we haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> we're, we haven't I, talked about it yet. I did also want to mention that one of the advantages of this is that often the people that whose contracts we're considering are traveling some distance to be at the meetings. And that won't be necessary now, which is good environmentally as well as for their time and efficiency. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we hate to make people travel a long way and, and um, just to present a contract or a, or a proposal or agreement or something. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Um, and it is, it is uh, helping alleviate or at least ease congestion on many of our major roadways. I mean, there are a lot of benefits to this, um, paying for parking downtown, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there are a lot of advantages to uh, working from your home or office um, if you can. So did you want to add anything, Commissioner Gibbons? Uh no, but I, I would point out that we're not allowed to dial in or be uh, electronically present for more than 50% of the meetings in any given year. So we are we have some requirement built into this in terms of being present mm -hmm. in person. Mm -hmm. Yet ironically, according to state law, we don't actually have to work very often. Right, <laughs> once a month. <laughs> Ironically, <laughs> I'm just gonna just point that out. <laughs> that, that's just an oddity and yeah. All right. Um, okay, so with that, um, it looks like we don't have any other uh, comments or questions. Uh, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on ordinance 2021-23? Uh, Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Githens. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, next item, please. Move to approve Beam Long Sniff LLC on call engineering agreement. Fund name cumulative bridge, fund number 1135, in an amount that will be an hourly rate as needed. Second. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Ridge. Good morning again. Uh, we've had a contract <clears throat> with this firm for many years. 
on assisting the department where our, our bridges are concerned. An uh, example that we might use their services, um, if we have a tornado in a certain area and there are some bridges that we feel that might have experienced some type of damage that cannot be seen, you know, just from uh, the natural eye, then we called them in for, and we have done this in the past, for a more in-depth engineering assessment of that bridge for the safety of the traveling motorist. Uh, we will only <clears throat> use this firm on an as-needed basis, um, so it will not be continuous. So we just felt it was time to update the contract because it had been a while. Great, thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? No, I don't. Commissioner Giffins? Um, I know it's in our packet, but would you remind the public how many bridges the, the county's responsible for? We have 154 bridges at this point. Um, it doesn't matter whether it falls on a city street or a county road, um, it always falls under the county jurisdiction to be able to ma maintain these bridges. Yeah, great. Uh, that's like one of those good trivia questions to, yeah. Um, all right, excellent. Let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Just raise your hand on the Zoom screen. Okay, uh, seeing none, um, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on the motion to approve of the Longest Neff LLC on-call engineering agreement? Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Giffins? Yes. Motion is approved, three to zero. All right, thank you. Uh, we don't have any appointments. I have just a few quick announcements. Uh, first and foremost, we are as always accepting applications for boards and commissions, but we do wanna highlight the fact that there's an opening on the South Central Community Action Program Board. So anybody interested in that, please contact us um, as soon as possible. Um, go to co.monroe.im.us, go to boards and commissions and complete an application and uh, you can submit that electronically. Uh, also, uh, just a note that if any, every, County resident lives in the township. If you are struggling to pay for rent, utilities, or other necessities, to uh, please contact your township trustee as soon as possible. Contact information is available at co.monroe.in.us on the emergency management page. It's also part of our minutes every week. Thank you, Ms. Freeman, for doing that, um, which are part of our packets. So just go to any one of our packets and you can open it and see that list. Uh, we have worked with the uh, county council to provide township assistance funding, uh, sort of an extra uh, funding level uh, from CARES funding, and that uh, is available to the township trustees to provide to our residents. Uh, we're at over $80,000 so far to 148 uh, homes uh, in our community. Uh, also, a quick note to thank uh, Susan Dyer for her work as Executive Director of Monroe County History Center. Uh, since 2017, she has been Executive Director and made great uh, changes and improvements and got through got this great organization through the pandemic. Um, she is retiring, um, and I know the board, staff, volunteers, and every resident in Monroe County says thank you for your service. Uh, anything else from my colleagues? I just want to remind people uh, about the Red Cross Blood Drive. They can go to redcross.org, click on Give Blood, and get registered. Uh, we have blood drives not only in May, but they've scheduled things out through June and July as well. So um, please, if you're able, you can donate once every 56 days, I believe it is. Um, but it, it makes a difference. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, would um, 13 minutes work for you all as break time? Okay, 11, how about 11.31? <laughs> we'll come back at 11.31, get 14 minutes, and we will see you for the work session. And with that, our regular session is adjourned. Thank you so much. <laughs>